Welcome, dear viewers, to the Triple Six Terrathon. Behind door number one lies a world of wonder where your better family is waiting. This is the tale of Coraline. <clears throat> Coraline began as a novella by British author Neil Gaiman, published in 2002. I remember seeing it at book fairs when I was in grade school, and while I never chose to read it, that cover art burrowed itself into my memory. Seven years later, the book was adapted into a stop-motion film by Leica Entertainment, the company that would later produce such films as Paranorman and Kubo and the Two Strings. Now let's dig into this delectable feast of family-friendly horror. The story follows Coraline Jones, a young girl who's become bored and dissatisfied with her life after moving to the Pink Palace Apartments. Upon exploring her new home, she discovers a hidden door leading to a fantastical parallel world. But she soon learns that in both worlds, not all things are as they seem. We've been waiting for you, Coraline. For me. It's a relatively simple plot, and that's okay. It's the characters that make this story shine. Coraline is surrounded by quirky, unusual neighbors, the acrobatic Bobinski, retired actresses Miss Spink and Forcible, and Wybie. Wybie? Short for Wyborn. On the surface, they're the kind of people that most would write off as crazy or weird, and Coraline does so at first. Yet you can see that they're all decent people. They show her genuine hospitality in their own ways, and try to warn her of the danger in the house. I see a very peculiar hand. I see a giraffe. Our antagonist for the film is the Other Mother, aka the Bell Dam. She is terrifying. The Bell Dam is a witch that spies on the lives of unhappy children, lures them into her lair and gives them everything they want, only to consume their lives when she's done with them. Part of what makes her so unnerving, appearance-wise anyway, is her face. Those soulless button eyes and that toothy, overcompensating grin. If you think she's creepy as is, wait till you see her true form. As Coraline turns on her, she becomes increasingly skeletal and monstrous until her disguise falls away entirely. Her sharp, mechanical parts and spider-like appearance suit her role as a malicious hag, a bringer of death that knows nothing but weaving intricate webs and devouring children. Befitting that a creature so eager to eat is so skeletal. Even more terrifying is how much power she has in her domain. When Coraline refuses to stay with her forever, she steals her parents. You're going to stay here forever. Now, what of Coraline herself? She's a lovable, strong protagonist, an adventurous girl with a kind heart beneath her initially cranky shell. And when danger comes calling, she proves to be quick-witted and resourceful. Although she's bratty at times, mainly in the first half, she consistently shows that she's not a mean girl. After all, I'm just a big fat wuss Come back, please. I'm sorry I called you that. I really am. There's a particular detail to her design that strikes me as interesting. Her dragonfly-shaped hair clip. I had been seeing this bug pop up in other animations I've been watching, so it made me wonder, why would they pick this bug? As it turns out, dragonflies have numerous symbolisms from across the world, among them being symbols of self-discovery and change in perspective. Knowing that, it all starts to come together. Immaturity and lack of perspective are Coraline's biggest weaknesses. She starts out thinking her parents' preoccupation with work, unappetizing meals, and refusal to buy her things meant that they don't care about her. Rather, it was due to factors that she didn't pick up on or understand. They were in a tough spot financially due to a car accident, her mother sustained a neck injury in said accident, and they were on a tight deadline with work. If things go well today, I promise I'll make it up. That's what you always say. You can say Coraline begins as a nymph, an immature dragonfly. Her selfish perspective and desire for nice things makes her ample prey for the Bell Dam. 
but Coraline learns that material gifts are no replacement for love, and earns her wings by outwitting the spider and saving her parents. It took a pink dog's worth of courage to pull that off. Much like Nightmare, it couldn't be more apparent that the Coraline crew poured their hearts and souls into this project. Everything from the animation, to the cinematography, to the props and puppets are masterfully composed. While writing this, I couldn't decide where to start. Every character, human or otherwise, moves and expresses themselves like they were living, breathing actors. They dance across the sets with believable motion and distinct mannerisms tailored to their built-in personalities. One of my favorite examples of this is Coraline exploring her new home. Seeing her climb and bounce around the house drives home that she's a curious kid looking for amusement. And it's much more relatable and entertaining than watching her simply walk around the house and take notes like a schlub. I especially enjoy her stomping on this ripple in the carpet as if it's challenging her. When she flattens it, she looks down like she was going to say, Ha! I beat you! So adorable. Honestly, the facial animation in this film is to die for. Major characters like Coraline and her mother are expressive enough to convey complex and nuanced feelings. It feels like they never make the same face twice. Speaking of looks, and feels, the filmmakers took care to create contrast between the real world and the other world. For most of the film, the real world is muted and gray, reflecting the tough situation Coraline's family is in. The other world is much more colorful. Too colorful. Everything is so saturated in color that it looks artificial, like the world was candy-coated. Given that the other world's splendor is just a facade, this coloration works. Its unnatural feel is more apparent when compared to the real world at the end of the film. Looks more natural, doesn't it? This contrast is key to how the film builds up to the horror. It starts us off in a normal world with only hints of what's to come. As Coraline begins exploring the other world, it maintains a whimsical yet slightly creepy vibe. Subtle details make the sets feel like something straight out of a dream, like the moon visibly rising and trees in the garden unfurling. But once the film takes this wicked turn... You're not sewing buttons in my eyes! Oh, but we need a yes if you want to stay here. We suddenly find ourselves trapped in a nightmare. The lighting grows darker and ominous, the camera work tenser and more off kilter. No point. He pulled a long face, and Mother didn't like it. Uh. There's more in this film than just whimsy and horror, however. There's doses of melancholy, too. Take this scene after Coraline's parents disappear. <sighs> right away, it's such a strong, sad contrast between the happy family photo and Coraline standing alone in her parents' bedroom doorway. The music makes it even more heartbreaking. It's a variation of a track used for when Coraline was exploring the house on her own. Good night, Mom. Oh yes, the music. Whether it's a mystical hymn being sung over the garden, or the booming urgency of an approaching danger, the orchestra and chorus are there to help immerse you into the story. Some tracks sport the voices of children singing in a nonsense language, a chilling yet playful sound that I'd never heard before this film. I can go on and on about how creative this film is artistically. What's just as amazing is how creative it is technically. When I watch the behind-the-scenes footage and see all the machinations beneath the set and the ways they achieved different effects, it's nothing short of magical. They used painted popcorn as cherry blossoms and dog toys for other plants. It's inspiring to see such ordinary objects transformed into wondrous props. Some props look like they were full-sized objects that they zapped with a shrink ray, like these hand-knit gloves. No, really, these tiny gloves and other clothes were knit by hand. To me, one of the most mind-boggling feats in this film is the climactic confrontation with the Bell Dam. You horrible cheating girl! <laughs> a floor that collapses into a suspended web of metal. Just think about having to animate that in stop motion. They achieved this effect using winches controlled by computers, programmed to collapse in the right pattern. I shudder at the thought of how long it took to get that right. This is hands down one of my favorite animated films. 
It's immensely creative, both artistically and technically, weaving its visual prowess into a touching, timeless story. Coraline was a great success for Laika, making back twice its budget at the box office and receiving numerous accolades. It scored a few wins at the Annie Awards, including the prizes for Best Music, Production Design, and Character Design, and tied for first at the Annecy International Animated Film Festival. If you're looking for a spooky film to watch with the family this Halloween, I highly recommend this one. And that concludes the first night of the Terrathon. Thank you for watching. <laughs>